you dirty guys, you dirty guys. So you can see very clearly a bifurcation of the otaku image happening in the, on the streets of Akihabara. This is another new development. This is a free tour of Akihabara that happens each week, uh, every Saturday. So they do two tours. They walk around. They talk about basically how consumerism is very Japanese. Literally, that's what they talk about. So they say, well, people collect dolls. People did that a long time ago. We have like these kokishi. It's, it's very Japanese. <laughs> they say, well, people like to be in cities. They like to kind of appreciate the aesthetics of consumerism, of kind of like the connoisseurs of, of consumerism. Isn't that urbanity? Isn't that Edo culture? So they basically are trying to tie what's happening in Akihabara to a larger discourse on Japanese culture. This is very interesting because in the 1990s, of course, otaku were social dropouts, rejects. They were the most infantile, individual, eccentric people you could imagine, right? So the discourse completely switched. This is just one day in Akihabara. My tour here, made tour here, being shown on TV and the Akihabara uh, Discovery Tour by the Yokosuka Japan people. This is the same day, there's a bus driving through the streets, bringing tourists, usually from China. So what is, what is going on? What is going on? What's happening here in, in Akihabara? Well, one way to understand what's happening here is um, basically the Ministry of Foreign Affairs out of control. Um, for those of you who don't know about the, the Kawaii Taishi, the Kawaii Ambassadors, that's harebrained. That's crazy, right? To think that three girls in Lolita schoolgirl costumes are going to kind of develop tourism for Japan. This is actually hashed by like a handful of people in the foreign ministry who had some money. They didn't know what to do with it, so they just kind of threw it at these three girls. One of them actually was chosen because the guy was flipping through TV, and he saw her on Kawaii TV, and he said, ah, Kawaii TV, she's Kawaii, bam, she's in. <laughs> so there's, very, there's, there's an astounding, an astounding lack of planning going on in this organization. And um, the whole Cool Japan campaign is really demonstrative of that. So let me give you an example. Puffy Amiyumi, who was basically dead in Japan, right? They weren't very popular. They go overseas, they start selling CDs, they sing kind of like the Powerpuff Girls song, and yeah, they're kind of cool, right? The Puffy Amiyumi show is kind of cool, right? And so there's this image that perhaps Puffy Amiyumi might be cool for Americans. I'm not sure if it's true, but people believe that Puffy Ami Amiyumi might be cool. Sure enough, the next year, here they are on a Come See Our Cool Japan poster by Yokoso Japan. Cartoon Network right there. <laughs> it's, it's clear, it's very clear what's going on here, right? They're trying to sell an image of Japan created by foreigners for foreigners to foreigners. They're trying to kind of route that through Japan. So they're kind of trying to capture that soft power that's already occurring overseas and say, well, this is not just any pop culture, this is Japanese pop culture. Slam! Stamp that bad boy. Okay, uh, this is another example. This is Cool Japan, a, a photo album tour released of, um, of places in, uh, in, uh, in Tokyo and Japan. This is um, Radio Kaikon, which I mentioned earlier, the first high-rise building built in Akihabara. And I want you to look at this. Cool Japan, otaku, Nippon, guide. I mean, it's not just Nihon, it's Nippon, which to me sounds a little bit more, you know, even more kind of, you know, staunch and stalwart, like Nippon. So right there, you've got otaku equated with cool Japan and Japan in general, right there. So interesting kind of um, thing going on here. Who's to blame? People say he's to blame. I'm not sure if that's true. I think he, he kind of just rode the wave of cool Japan. But he's a real character, and people love him in Akihabara because he said such strange things. He once said that um, the trains in Tokyo could kick the crap out of the trains in New York, right? So he, he, he said things that were just wonderful for otaku. They went on to Meat Channel, onto the, the bulletin board, and they just typed that stuff out. Like, Asocha, he's so awesome, right? <laughs> and he was making periodic visits to Akihabara all throughout his campaign, from the foreign ministry to the prime minister uh, seat. He was making... Um, orchestrations towards otaku, towards Akihabara, towards kind of this cool pop culture. And you see here, this is by Akiba Keizai Shimbun, which is um, the only official news source in Akihabara. They released a book about how Akihabara, the day Akihabara swallows the world, basically, is a translation. So all the news they had collected from Akihabara about cool Japan and stuff like that. And on the front, otaku equals cool. I also think so. 
So, I mean, it's, it's clear also how they're kind of playing off of each other. Akiba Keizai Shimbun is tongue-in-cheek when they say this, because they realize, of course, that what we have, which is usually young little girls in rather risque positions, isn't going to sell, right, to a lot of people. So they realize that we're talking about a niche culture being packaged as something that it's not. For those of you who are into otaku culture, it's like talking about moe anime like it's Miyazaki anime. It's completely different. It, they don't even compare to each other. So the Akiba Keizai Shimbun was uh, very, um, wow, they were drawing a blank. <laughs> Akiba Keizai Shimbun was drawing a blank when they, when they saw what was happening in Akihabara. But I wasn't, I'll tell you that. What I saw was, I saw two Akihabaras, that's what I saw. The first image should have been just the uh, side section of the street here. So you've got the electric shops, the uh, electronic shops here, you've got shops selling animation manga goods, you've got game shops here, secondhand stores, and if you go a little bit farther, it's actually one more level, a shorter level, which is more kind of niche and otaku stuff. So the farther you get away from the station, the more kind of creative and uncontrolled it becomes. But I see something lurking in the background there. Something that looks very strange. Um, something that kind of defies conventional wisdom, which is buildings should have no windows, they should be closed, they should be colorful, gaudy, they should be kind of subculture, they should be covered in pictures of beautiful girls. This is what Morikawa Kaichiro, kind of the man who wrote the book on Akihabara, literally, what he believes Akihabara should look like. It should look like an, what he calls uh, an ethnic ghetto for otaku, a subcultural ghetto. But really it's not so. It's two different Akihabaras. They're competing with each other to kind of create a dominance. This is um, competing with each other for cultural dominance. This is uh, the UDX building. The UDX building was erected in 2006. It's a huge building, probably one of the largest in all of Akihabara. The name stands for Urban Development Cross. And it was built by MTT Docomo, which is kind of a, this huge telecommunications conglomerate. And they wanted to kind of showcase, of course, Japanese contents industry and um, high, uh, high technology. One of the things they did, though, is they built, um, well, the people who were developing this entire track of land here built this, which is the <coughs> Tokyo Times Tower. They were expecting that if they built um, this giant apartment complex with, like, you know, million-dollar rooms, somebody would move there, right? Somebody would come to Akihabara and live in these apartments. It's not these guys, right? It's not the people who are living next door in Okachimachi. They're worse off, right? So who is it, right, in the lower city who's going to live in this building. It's obvious they were trying to set it up for something else, right? And sure enough, if you go there today, the building is still almost empty because they're imagining something that um, just isn't there. This is the image of Akihabara, of Akihabara kind of drafted by the uh, Ishihara Shintaro plan, the governor of, of Tokyo, his plan for kind of a new lower city. If you look at the whole thing, you see this kind of a, a giant spire stuck into the side of the the river there. That's the Sto Sto uh, Tokyo Sky Tree, which is the worst name for a tower I've ever heard. But it, it's going to be right there, and around that, you're going to have rings of development, right? And what's very close to the lower city, actually in the lower city, is Akihabara. It's very near to Tokyo, it's very near to Ueno, it's right on the tourist track there, right on the Amanote line, right on the Sogu line, right on the, the uh, Chuo line. So it's, it's basically the perfect place to redevelop it. It can it kind of be like the, the first stage in a larger development project. Okay, so but down to my, um, my specific research. So given this context, I started kind of um, looking at Akihabara and seeing what kind of things were being said about what kinds of people, what was happening, what was going on. This is Kobayashi Takaya. He was very, um, very useful informant for me. He's a very nice guy. I love him to death. But he believes that Akihabara is not for the otaku. He believes that Akihabara is a place for the lower townspeople. It's a place for merchants. It's a place for older people. It's a place, it's a place for his constituency which is um, basically elderly people, about 5,000 of them who live in the Soto Kanda, the outside Kanda region area of the town. So he has to pander these people. And older people don't like younger people, so they'd say, get them off the streets, and he does that. He calls the police. And he believes that um, by getting the younger people off the streets, he's not only going to uh, please his constituency, he's also going to make room for the next stage, the next phase of Akihabara's development, which is large buildings, Mega structures, to use his words, and um, contents industry. 